Hey guys, I'm going to talk to you about how to make notes. And here's the reason why. Your brain is like this can. You keep putting information in, but ultimately it keeps leaking out if you don't make effective notes. So what that means is your brain forgets 80% of the stuff that it's learned by the next day. That's a crazy amount. So what we need is instead of it all leaking away, we need a second brain. Now the second brain will be your set of notes. And what kind of notes are we talking about? Are we talking about just capturing everything? No, there are two types of notes. You can either make rough notes where you're capturing stuff down as you're going along, or secondly, your neat notes. Your neat notes is your brain processing all of this information into something that's useful to you. So the first thing I'm gonna assume is that your exam is going to be handwritten. And even if you're not doing an exam or your exam is not handwritten, it is easier to draw diagrams for understanding different things. For example, you want to talk about the relationship between two entities. Now, it's very hard to play around with Microsoft Word or Google Docs or something to really show how X and Y might be related in a scientific principle that you're trying to understand. It is a lot easier to represent this if you are handwriting this stuff. Now, imagine now this was some sort of a recursive relationship, which means that the output of this goes into the input of X again. So maybe we wanted to show it goes back around. So again, having a pen or a tablet, that's even better because if you're using something like an iPad or a tablet, then you can even store this digitally. My suggestion would be a notepad or a tablet. The other thing with the handwritten digital notes is you can go back and edit them usually. Let's get stuck into our list of what do you need to do to make awesome notes. So number one, we want to use multiple resources. What I mean by this is that I like to quote a favorite TV show of mine, which many of you may have watched, Avatar The Last Airbender, where Uncle Iroh in there mentions that it is important to draw wisdom from many different places. If we take it from only one place, it becomes rigid and stale. So what we want to do is we want to get knowledge from multiple sources. So I don't want you to just learn from your school teacher or learn from me. I don't just want you to learn from a textbook. I don't just want you to learn from YouTube, right? I want you to use multiple different resources. And once you look at all the different resources and you combine what they are saying, because I might be an expert at one thing, but your textbook might be explaining another topic really well. Not everyone is an expert on every single topic within that subject. So you want to find the best explanation for that topic. And what you are gonna do is you are gonna make your own set of notes based off that. So point one might have come from someone else, point two might have come from someone else, three from someone else and so on and so forth. But what you've got is the ultimate set of notes. And I like to call this your one source of truth. Your one source of truth is a concept that I learned during my technology consulting days, where the idea is that you want one database that you can rely on if your life depended on it. I want you to ask yourself the question, whatever you've been studying recently, can you look at your notes and say, this is the best form of understanding this? If not, then your notes have not been made correctly. We need to ensure that these notes are there to act like your one source of truth when you want to look back at it at a future point. Some quick fire points now. In terms of your notes, you want to keep them short so keep them short don't waffle use abbreviations the point of making notes is to understand stuff it doesn't matter if you write the thing in full or if you write abbreviations of it the point is are you understanding the topic so keep it abbreviated keep it short and what is the overall benefit of this to your notes the benefit is when it comes to memorizing or when it comes to recalling or learning this information if you've got it condensed to let's say five pages or ten pages then that's amazing instead of having to look at 200 pages for the same piece of information. Now for something like GCSE maths, you can condense all of your GCSE maths in about 10 sites, really. It really pays to keep it short, use abbreviations where possible, and it doesn't need to be correct grammar either. By the same token as the previous points, we don't even need it to be in the correct grammar. All we care about is, do you understand it when you look at your notes? If you do, then who cares about adding the at the front or writing a full stop at the end. Who cares? Nobody. I don't care. Do you care? I don't care. Number six. Okay, this is a biggie. A lot of tutors, a lot of teachers out there will tell you, you should be highlighting your notes. Actually, there are a lot of studies that show that highlighting is one of the worst things that you can do when it comes to making notes. Highlighting doesn't really benefit. In fact, Highlighting may even harm your understanding because you're too focused on that specific word rather than the overall concept. No highlighting. Now, 
I do want to say, if you're that type of person who wants to make their notes look pretty, then be my guest. But the important thing is to make sure you can read and understand your notes. So if you want to do it for the purpose of making it pretty and all of that kind of fun stuff, then yeah, go ahead and highlight. But know that it's not going to make a difference to your understanding. Talking about readability, make sure your notes are readable. So write neatly. Look, the point of your notes is that you're going to refer back to them six months later, two weeks later, a year later, who knows? Write on a neat A4 paper is what I would say, or as I said, write on a tablet. Number eight, stick to the syllabus. So when you have your different resources and you're looking at the material, what you want to do is you want to stick to the syllabus. Now the syllabus, sometimes known as the specification, effectively is a checklist, okay? So it's a checklist of items that you guys need to know, all right? And you want to make sure that you have covered everything from A to Z. So please use this as your guiding light when you are making your notes. Ultimately, when your notes are made, you can discard the syllabus and your notes will be the new one source of truth as we already discussed. So make sure you are closely following what your syllabus is. If you don't know what that is, ask your teacher, find in the back of the book what syllabus, what specification is the subject that you are analyzing. This is where we get, get to the crux of the matter of how to make notes, right? So what we want to do is we want to make sure, yes, we've got the scope, we've got the syllabus there, right? But we don't just want to copy. Don't just copy. Really? Why not? Do not do that. Because if you're just copying, you are not understanding. The point of making notes is to digest this difficult piece of information. So what you really want to do is rewrite. You want to rewrite, reorganize the information. And this is a good acid test. If you're just directly copying something out, there is a good chance, okay? There is a good chance you haven't done the notes properly. Now, sometimes you may need to copy it out because it's a definition, right? Okay, so enthalpy of formation in chemistry, for example. It's a definition, you need to know it. But if it's like a process or you're understanding something, then you really need to try to rewrite and reorganize this. And the best way you can do that is by use of diagrams. So use diagrams. Okay, diagrams. So this includes like mental models. This includes timelines. So for example, one tool that you could use is like a timeline. For example, you're studying history. A really good way to understand a timeline is to draw it out. Don't write fact after fact, draw a timeline. So that's one tool that you could use. You could use something like a flow chart. That's also very useful. Again, it could be used for something like a timeline. So I've used this for the atomic model quite a lot. So the history of an atomic model. This is how I would describe it. Another tool that you could use is a table. Yeah, often not used when people are making notes, but say, for example, you are comparing multiple things. I don't know, you are describing the processes of separation in chemistry. Okay, then you might have, for example, the process here. You might have uh, the description of it. You might have an example of it here and so on and so forth. Depending on what it is that you're doing, then it really makes it easy for you to compare these different things. So a table is another good tool that you can use. We've got brainstorms. So you've got a mind map, for example. This I tend to use less often because it's less structured, but some people prefer it. And there is some good evidence behind mind maps. But what I would not do is make all of my notes using mind maps. Again, the reason being that it's unstructured, unless you can be super thousand percent confident that you haven't missed anything out, right? This can be problematic for most students. Of course, diagrams, for example, say the heart, right? Now you would need to be able to draw the heart or at least label it in, say, if you're studying biology, then if you just need to be able to label it, then just stick a diagram on. If you need to be able to draw it, definitely draw the diagram itself over here. Instead of just writing the different points, here is the aorta, here are the, the veins or whatever, right? Put a visual picture there because your memory reacts more to visual images than it would to monotonous acres and acres of text. So we are trying to keep it short. We are trying to make it useful and appropriate to what we are studying. We are trying to do that. Another example is like a life cycle diagram. So now you might be studying recycling or something and you may want to draw a life cycle diagram. So you have many more like pie charts and bar charts and all of this kind of stuff. So wherever possible, try to stick diagrams in because they will really break up the flow and really help you retain that piece of information. We're at the end game. Now, number 12, try not to write examples down. Now, this might sound a bit scary, 
how can you not write examples down? And especially if you understand that examples are a very good way of learning. Any great teacher will always give you examples. They will always give you analogies. So examples are actually a very good way of understanding, but we don't want them in our notes. Here's why, all right? So when you're learning a concept, you'll generally learn it through an example. Okay, so example, let's call it example one. Now, the problem is they're showing you an example because they really want to teach you a concept. So the skill that you need to learn is not what the example is, but what is the concept, the generalized concept that you need to learn. So that takes effort. And that is the point of making notes. So I want you to sit there and try to work out what is the underlying concept here. And that is what you need to capture. If you learn this, when you go into an exam, what happens is that they're then going to ask you an example and you will need to apply it to that example. But this example might be different to the first example, right? So that is why you need to understand the generalization. So what we do is we decontextualize. And then when you get to an exam paper, let's call it a paper. Let's call it your notes and let's call this, I don't know, a book or something, right? What's happening is from here to here, you need to decontextualize. You need to understand what the general idea is. And then from here to here, you need to be able to apply this concept to a specific example. Now, what happens if you only learn the example and they give you a different example in the exam? Kaput. Yeah, game over for you, my friend. Go back to sleep. We can't do that. We need to wake up, smell the coffee and learn the concept. Cottoning onto this point, right? And moving on from and related to this point, another important rule is you should be able to explain whatever you're learning to a 10 year old. Let's say an eight year old, forget a 10 year old, let's say an eight year old. Can you explain your concept to an eight year old? If you can't, then again, your notes are not good enough. Now, look, a lot of you have the proclivity to try to rush through your notes. That's not the point. The point is to understand what you're reading, what you're watching, what you're listening to and conceptualize that so you can explain it to an eight-year-old child. Now I'm going to re-emphasize. Now look, note-taking is ultimately about research. I had a friend who was doing PhD and his professor told him, think about the word research. What does it say? Re-search. Literally, you need to go and search again if you don't find the answer. So it's not just I copy everything down that I see. No, you go and research it until you're able to explain that concept to an eight-year-old, until you truly understand this generalized concept. And that is the essence of note making. Most students, I would say, don't know how to do this. If you have a friend, share this with them and teach them how to make good notes. Do your good deed for the day. So now that you've done your notes, I want you to take your time and think about what the next steps are. No, I don't. Go watch this video and this will explain what the next steps are once you've done your notes.